So the urea cycle is a very important process or cycle in the body because this is the main driver of elimination of metabolic waste. So through the when the body breaks on a lot of amino acids or amino acid derivatives, it creates a very toxic nitrogenous waste. And this nitrogenous waste can then really cause a lot of toxic alterations and deficits in the neurological system. And you need urea in order to remove this so that it doesn't build up in the tissues. So the primary function of the urea cycle, as I mentioned, is to take this kind of NH4-like toxic system to produce urea. Now, why is urea so special? So urea has this oxygen on the end of it, which makes it very water soluble. So it makes it very favorable to travel in the blood and be excreted by the kidneys. However, you can use a small percentage of, of urea uh, and alter it in a way in which it can be eliminated through the stool. However, the main driver for all of the wa waste excretion is, is via the genital urinary system, especially when we're talking about nitrogenous waste. So here's the urea cycle. So the urea cycle is composed of five enzymes that you'll need to know. It's also composed of two specific amino acids that are important for the cycle itself. And the last step is production of ornithine. So it doesn't complete an end. It actually uses this ornithine to then recycle back into the mitochondria to start this process over again. And that's why it's important to understand that this is a cycle. This kind of keeps on going on and on and on again. And you need to understand that this all occurs in the liver. And don't forget that. People often think kidneys, kidneys, kidneys. No. This occurs in the liver. And then what happens is this all travels in the blood to the kidneys for excretion. So now I'm going to talk about step one of the urea cycle. So like I said, it begins in the mitochondria with the enzyme CPS1. And CPS2 is the exact same enzyme, but it's used in the hematologic process, as we'll describe a little bit on. So what happens is you use CO2 and the presence of NH3 as well as the presence of the allosteric activator and acetylglutamate, and you use this to produce carbon monophosphate in the presence of CPS1. This is really important because this is the rate limiting step of the urea cycle. Step two is where you take ornithine transcobamylase as the enzyme. We're still in the mitochondria, and you produce citrulline. Citrulline is then shuttled into the cytoplasm for steps three through five. In step three, aspartate now comes in. This is that one amino acid that you need to know. Aspartate comes in, combines with citrulline in the cytoplasm now in the presence of arginosuccinate synthetase and produces arginosuccinate. And what I love about the urea cycle is all these enzymes are named so appropriately, as you'll see my favorite in the next one. So now you have your arginosuccinate in the presence of arginosuccinase, and we're still in the cytoplasm, you produce two, arginine, which is an amino acid, and you also produce fumarate. Fumarate is what goes into the Krebs cycle, and you can use, you, know, you have to remember that as well, because sometimes that's often tested on too. So then we, now you're still in the cytoplasm. This is your, your, your last and final step right here is where you have your arginine in the presence of your last enzyme, arginase. See another one that's very appropriately named. And this is where you produce your urea and ornithine, but you're still in the cytoplasm. So this now can be excreted out of the cytoplasm into the blood and then go to the kidneys where this ornithine can then be converted using the enzyme we talked about, enzyme number two, ornithine transcarbamylase, produce citrulline, goes back into the mitochondria for this process and then occur all over again. So here's the overview again. Don't forget, you have five enzymes, carbon monophosphate synthetase one, ornithine transcarbamylase, arginosuccinate synthetase, arginosuccinase, arginase. You have two, ends, two amino acids, you have a Krebs cycle intermediate, you produce urea, which is a water-soluble substance, ornithine then goes back into the cytoplasm to produce citrulline to then start the cycle all over again. So now we're going to talk about some clinical pearls that are related to the urea cycle. So the first one I'm going to talk about is ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. This is the most common urea cycle enzyme disorder. It's X-linked recessive and what happens is, is you have a, you have a def deficit absence of, of ornithine transcarbamylase. It causes an increase in carbon oil phosphate, which then causes it to be shunted towards erotic acid. And what happens is now you have an increase in serum erotic acid, which can cause the features pretty much like all of these kind of cause exact same features. It causes features of hyperaminonemia, which is where you kind of get this encephalopathic, this confused, obtunded kind of picture. And this is pretty much kind of the hallmark of all of these. 
So you need to understand kind of what's going to separate them all out, but it's pretty much on the enzymatic level because they all are going to present with this confused, obtunded, lethargic kind of, uh, kind of picture. The biggest difference between ornithine and transcarbamylase is that from erotic aciduria is that you will not have anemia. Remember, this is this is kind of tied into the hemologic processes, but you will not have anemia with ornithine transcarbamylase, and that is how you differentiate the two on a test. So the next one is N-acetylglutamate synthetase, and as you remember, this is an allosteric activator that's important for carbon oil phosphate synthetase. This, however, is AR autosomal recessive, and yes, it's a pain in the butt, but you've got to, you do have to understand what the genetic inheritance patterns are. So all these clinical manifestations are very similar to CPS1 deficiencies, as we'll discuss later, because this is heavily tied in with CPS1. And you're going to get the exact same pictures, like I mentioned. You're going to, you're going to get this confused, attended asterixis, which is where you have a flapping of the hands when you kind of stick your hand out like a stop sign. You get a cereal edema, this lethargy. You can get developmental delay if, if when it's early on, retardation early on, poor feeding, poor regulation. But it's very, very easy to pick up. They, you know, these are often tested more in terms of understanding enzymatic pathways in the setting of this. So they'll give this this kind of lethargic, obtunded picture. They'll tell you the disease, and they often that's why they often go after these kind of things, like AR, or they'll go after what enzyme is missing, or they'll go after all, something similar to that, because these are very similar pictures. Then you have arginase deficiency. This also is AR. This is where you have a deficiency in the arginase enzyme, and what happens is you increase arginine and ammonia in the blood. So remember, as I said before, arginine is a very important amino acid. If you already have overload of arginine, then what happens is you can just skip right down to the bottom. What's the treatment? Just reduce the amount of consumption that's going to of arginine. Period. That's how you pretty much try to treat this. Because right off the bat, you're going to have the exact same features. I mean, the, the features of all this are very much that again, a tunded, confused picture. So this is often tested in two fashions. One, it's AR, and two, treatment low in protein decrease the consumption of arginine. So the next one we're going to talk about is carbon oil phosphate synthetase 1 deficiency, CPS1. This also is AR. And this is where ammonia will accumulate in the blood and again leads to what again? The exact same obtunded kind of picture. Okay? This is also treated by redu reducing the amount of protein intake and you treat it similar to hyperammonemia. So we, 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 we keep talking about all these disease processes pretty much presenting in the kind of the same way. A confused, lethargic, uh, obtunded picture. Uh, people are very sleepy, they're nausea, nauseous, they're vomiting, they have asterixis. And, and it's all because of ammonia. Like I said, ammonia is very toxic and probably most toxic because it can enter into the, the neurovascular system and produce uh, toxic effects on the CNS. And the problem with this is that it can actually cause permanent damage and that's why you need to treat this whether it's because of these processes or or say it's for a liver function period you have liver failure you need to treat this effectively so what are some available treatments for this you can give lactulose which converts nh3 to nh4 and then what happens is now you can use nh4 it can be excreted via the stool as you remember from that earlier on the slides a very small percentage could be excreted through the stool so this the you're giving lactulose is kind of capitalizing on that process you can also give rifaximine, which is an antibiotic, which is kind of interesting to think about. But yes, it's important because this kills the bacteria that produces excess NH3. Or you can give benzoic acid or phenol compounds that bind NH3 and then capitalize more on this, this uh, excretion of, through the bowels as well. And that concludes this chapter of Da Vinci Academy.